Throughout our Lenten season, we followed Jesus in his final steps as he would suffer to go to suffer and die. And so today, we follow him up to the foot of the cross where he hangs and he says those final words, words which we hang on today, especially as we remember the life and the, especially the death of our Savior Jesus suffered for us. Just a word of note, we will not be collecting the offering today. Um, if you are so, in, so inclined to do so, there are offering uh, opportunities to put an offering at both entrances here on the main level. You may do so on your way out if you have not already. We begin our Tenebrae service with our first hymn, hymn 435. Please stand. We continue with the confession of sins as printed in your service folder. I ask you before God who is able to search our hearts. Do you sincerely confess that you have sinned against God and deserve his wrath and punishment? Then declare so by saying, I do confess. And certainly... You should confess, for the Holy Scriptures declare, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Do you truly repent of all your sins committed in thought, word, and deed? Then declare so by saying, I do repent. I do repent. Certainly you should repent, as did penitent sinners, like King David, who prayed for a contrite heart, Peter, who wept bitterly, the prodigal son, and others. Do you sincerely believe that God, by grace, through Jesus, forgives you of all of your sins? Then declare so by saying, I do believe. I do believe. Certainly you should believe. For the scriptures declare, God so loved the world 
that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Do you promise that with the aid of the Holy Spirit you will, from this time forward, change your sinful life? Then declare so by saying, I do promise. Certainly, you should promise. For Christ the Lord says, Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Finally, do you believe that through me, a called servant of God, you will receive the forgiveness of all your sins? Then declare so by saying, I do believe. Imagine for a moment if that was it. There was no declaration of forgiveness. You would say and believe all of these words, but that's all you would hear. is silence. One more reason to give thanks each and every time you and I have the pleasure and privilege of coming and confessing our sins to a God who in His Son, Jesus Christ, assures us, as you believe, so shall it be done. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called servant of the Word, announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the place and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins, In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated as we now continue with hymn 430.
Passion reading for Good Friday. Two other men who were criminals were led away with Jesus to be executed. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. They'd offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. They crucified him there with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Now it was the third hour when they crucified him. Pilate also had a notice written and fastened on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this notice because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but but that this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier. They also took his tunic, which was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, well, let's not tear that. Instead, let's cast lots to see who gets it. This was so that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So the soldiers did these things. Then they sat down and were keeping watch over him there. People who passed by kept insulting him, shaking their heads and saying, Oh, you who were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. Those who were crucified with him also insulted him. In the same way, the chief priests, experts in the law and the elders kept mocking him. They said, "Ah, he saved others, but he cannot save himself if he's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and then we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him, because he said, I am the Son of God. One of the criminals hanging there was blaspheming him, saying, Aren't you the Christ? Well, save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? Since you're under the same condemnation, we are punished justly, for we are receiving what we deserve. For what we have done, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, Amen, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Jesus' mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene were standing near the cross. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time, this disciple took her into his own home. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, until the sun was darkened. At the ninth hour, Jesus shouted with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. After this, knowing that everything had now been finished and to fulfill the scripture, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there. Immediately, one of them ran, took a sponge, and soaked it with sour wine. Then they put it on a stick and gave him a drink. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Suddenly the temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and rocks were split. Tombs were opened and many bodies of saints who had fallen asleep were raised to life. Those who came out of the tombs went to the holy city after Jesus' resurrection and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were guarding Jesus with him saw the earthquake and how he cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last, they were terrified and began to glorify God, saying, This man really was righteous. Truly, this was the Son of God. When all the groups of people who had gathered to see this spectacle saw what had happened, they returned home beating their chests. And all those who knew Jesus and many women who had followed Jesus from Galilee and who had served him, they were there watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, Salome and the mother of Zebedee's sons. 
Now, since it was the preparation day, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses over the Sabbath, because that Sabbath was a particularly important day. They asked Pilate to have the men's legs broken and the bodies taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man who was crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other man. When they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they didn't break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. The one who saw it has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he's telling the truth so that you also may believe. Indeed, these things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look at the one they pierced. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. But he was secretly for fear of the Jews. Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, was a good and righteous man. He had not agreed with their plan and action. He was looking forward to the kingdom of God. He boldly went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised that Jesus was already dead. He summoned the centurion and asked him if Jesus had been dead for a long time. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he granted the body to Joseph. Joseph bought a linen cloth, came and took Jesus' body away. Nicodemus, who earlier had come to Jesus at night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 72 pounds. So they took Jesus' body and bound it with linen strips along with the spices in accord with Jewish burial customs. Well, there was a garden at the place where Jesus was crucified. In the garden was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so they laid Jesus there because it was a Jewish preparation day and the tomb was near. Joseph took the body and laid it in his own new tomb that he had cut out in the rock. He rolled a large stone over the tomb's entrance and left. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed after Joseph and they observed the tomb and how Jesus' body was laid there. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were watching where the body was laid. When they returned and prepared spices and perfumes on the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. Now on the next day, which was the day after the preparation day, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered in the presence of Pilate and said, uh, Sir, we remembered that this deceiver said while he was still alive, After three days I will rise again. So give the command that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples might steal his body and tell the people he's risen from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard. Go make it as secure as you know how. And so they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and posting a guard. Here ends our passion history. We turn then in the hymnal as we respond with Psalm 22. As it is printed, we ask you, the congregation, to sing the refrain and the glory be, as well as the indented verses, the indented verses. Trust in the Lord, they say. O sacred head, now wounded, with grief and shame weighed down, all my 
my bones are on display. A pack of villains encircles me. They divide my clothes among them. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. Glory be to the And so we arrive at those last seven words that our Savior would leave us with as he took those final steps to the altar that you and I know of as the cross. It's no surprise the Roman culture right along with its leadership had designed and engineered the cross to be an object of torture shame, scorn, and ridicule designed to make sure that whoever was put on there wouldn't die right away but would suffer to the most possible depths that they could while still staying alive and yet eventually dying. Long enough for our Savior Jesus, who is both God and man, to come with these first words. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. It's remarkable, really, that he even says the first word, considering his situation, Father, who's the one that got him there to begin with? Remember as he was in the garden with his disciples and he prayed to his father, is there some other way? And his father said, no, you must drink this cup of suffering. And yet as he hung there on the cross, willingly, he's not embittered toward his father. He's not even embittered to those who we've already heard, were gathered around and those who put him up there and even you and me whose sins would be the cause of it all. Instead, he's speaking to the Father on behalf of those who needed their sins forgiven. That's why he says, Father, forgive them, right? He didn't say, well, it's not a big deal that they put an innocent man to death. It's not a big deal that they're putting the Son of God and the Son of Man, to death. Just look the other way. Don't pay any attention to what's going on here. The acknowledgement is, yes, there has been sin committed, many of them. But yet, as intercessor, mediator, Savior, He comes on behalf of all the sinful world and those gathered there who put Him there, who, as He says, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Come on. Do you buy that? They don't know what they're doing. They didn't know what they were doing when they cooked up the lies against Jesus because they couldn't find anything. They didn't know what they were doing when they met together in secret under the cover of night, betraying and setting this all up, betraying um, Jesus to his friends, to his disciples through Judas. putting to death a man who had committed absolutely no wrong, and Pilate even said so in the trial. They didn't know what they were doing, and yet Jesus says those words, doesn't he? 
So what does he mean? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. In their ignorance, and really we might call it just unbelief. They didn't see Jesus as the Messiah. They didn't see him as a savior. They didn't see him as one who could and possibly would be the only one in their minds to fulfill all the scriptures and thus be able to remove from them what they could not remove from themselves, that is, their own sin. And so what is Jesus praying for? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them. Lead them in some way to turn from their sin to find forgiveness in you. Really, turn and lead them in this very moment to see what is happening here is exactly what they needed most, what you and I need most. May we never be like those who don't know what they're doing. In ignorance or unbelief, turn to our Savior and say, He's not mine. I don't need Him. No, not for my sins. But rather, as our Savior prays that prayer, He does it for us too. Father, forgive even me. For there are many times when I don't know what I'm doing. We respond with the first verse of the hymn as printed in your service folder. Jesus' second word from Luke 23, verse 43. I tell you the truth, or amen, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. So many people walked by as this was going on, perhaps stood and gawked, and as we recount earlier, many of them had some distasteful, if not even mocking words to say. He saved others. Ha! Let him save himself. He said he was going to raise the temple in three days. I don't see it happening. If you're the son of God, well then prove it. Get down off the cross and show us. Why don't you call out to your God? Maybe he'll answer you. From the Roman soldiers to the criminals who were hanging next to him. That's the way it started out, right? They started out with joining in the mockery. Hey, everybody else is doing it. Why not? As they hung there within a moment or moments of losing their own lives. And then all at once, what seemed to be so in keeping with what everyone else was doing, mocking the Savior... All at once, one of them grows strangely silent while the other chimes in again. Hey, hey, you know, um, 
if, if you're really the f- son of God, why don't you save yourself? And while you're at it, save us too. Get us down from here. And the one who grew silent suddenly pipes up and with words of faith and really humility, he says, don't you fear God? We're getting what we deserve. This guy's done nothing wrong. And then with those same words of faith-filled humility, he turns to Jesus and he doesn't make demands. He's not one who is an entitled heart, who lives in, in a land where I can do whatever I want and I should get whatever I want and this is, this is an injustice that I'm even up here. He says to Jesus, Jesus, whose name means Savior, remember me when you come into your kingdom? Not a demand, but a question asked in humility. But we don't focus so much on this man's question as much as we do on Jesus' response, which is our second word. Jesus says, Amen. Or I tell you the truth. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to tell you some pious wish. I'm not going to tell you something to make you feel good here because I know you're not going to be alive much longer. I'm not going to just kind of salve your conscience here and and not tell you what is really going to happen to you. I'm going to tell you the truth today. Not someday in the future. Not after you've checked off all of these boxes in your life. Not after you've spent some time in purgatory paying off your debt or someone else pays off your debt for you. Not in a time in the future after you've gone through some sort of transcendent universe and then finally arrived. But today, when you breathe your last and your heart just finally stops, You will be with me where I am in paradise. What's your idea of paradise? Sandy shores with, you know, that screensaver, the desktop that has the sandy shores and the the crystal clear waters, the beach. And of course, during the middle of winter, if we go back one week, pretty much, we could go back in the middle of winter and say, man, that'd be paradise right about now. And yet it doesn't compare. As much as we long for those sunny skies and warm weather and no work, all play, we still know that there's sin and there's still sorrow and there's still death that's waiting and that's not paradise. Jesus says, today you will be with me and it will be in paradise. Isn't it a wonder that a man like this who literally breaths away from his last one. He hears from the mouth of his Savior, your life was not a waste. All the things that you have done, they count for nothing. All the wrong that you have done, all the guilt that you bring, all that Satan brings up in your mind, all the things that you say, ah, man, if I could do it all over again, I wouldn't have done that. I wish I could really undo it all. Or maybe as you near the end of your life and Satan comes again and says, I really should be a better person and I should have been a better person in my life. I should have done more. There's no fine print. There's no legalese you have to wade through. There's no terms you have to sign. Jesus just simply says, by grace, because that's how I operate, today, not of your own doing, but of mine, you will be with me in paradise. That's how a God of grace works. That's why we call this a good and gracious and blessed Friday. Those are the words we might have tattooed on our hearts and minds. As we think about our pasts and we think about the sins that we tend to think that these are too big and Jesus says, no, 
I'm bigger than even the worst of sins, so that even today when you die, you will be with me in paradise. This is Jesus' second word. Let's respond. In the second verse. The third word from John 19, dear woman, here is your son, here is your mother. How do you prepare for death? If someone's going to die, if you're the one perhaps, how would you do it? Is the life insurance policy up to date? Do you have all those passwords that you need to get at everything that's necessary? Are the bills paid? Who's going to take care of this? Who's going to take care of that? We think about all those things, right? Wisely, planning, putting our estate and our affairs in order, putting the will out there. And as Jesus hangs here, it's remarkable Instead of crying out to his mother and saying, oh man, this is terrible, you've got to get me down, go find somebody, this is awful. What is Jesus thinking of? He's not thinking of his mother. He's thinking of the woman who now needs her, needs him rather, to be her Savior. I don't know if you remember back to when Jesus was with his disciples, and he was at that wedding at Cana, he would kind of say these same words. Woman, he wouldn't call his mother mother, he would call her woman. He wasn't being mean to her, he wasn't being unkind, he was simply letting her know, Mary, you need me more than I need you. And that's why he calls her woman. There's that separation Jesus makes here. In what he's going through, a sinner, Mary, is very much in need of him to be her Savior too. But being the God that he is, he knows just like he knows you and me needs for our earthly needs. He provides that for his mother, even as he honors and obeys and serves her to the very last breath just as he would provide that which a woman back in that day would have a hard time making a living. And so Jesus honors his mother, honors the woman who needs that Savior named Mary, but honors you and me too by showing us that he is not just concerned about our spiritual care and, well, your physical needs, who cares? He knows you and I need those too. And again, as he hangs there in the throes of death and those final beats of his heart, he thinks not about his own needs, but about those of his mother, his brother, his sister, you and me too. We sing verse 3.
The fourth word, Matthew 27, verse 46, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was a strange and eerie darkness that blanketed the night. Or no, it was daytime, which turned into night. Almost as though God was shutting out from the sun, the moon, the stars, and all those who were there, what was going on as Jesus hung there? As the world's, all of the world's sins, every single last one of them, was placed on his son at that very moment. In those hours of darkness, and Jesus then cries out a different cry. It's changed, isn't it? It's not my Father, it's my God. Because at that moment, God had, as Luther said, God had forsaken God? Who can understand that? And yet, while we don't need to know the how, we do know the what, and we do know the why. What was the reason why Jesus was forsaken? Was because Jesus at that very moment, hanging there on the cross about this time, was the worst of all sinners. For all time. For all eternity. And at that moment of darkness, it's as though the Father was pulling the curtain across the sky and saying, no one's going to see how horrific this is. I would never want anyone to experience the absolute pain of hell itself. No, Jesus didn't descend into hell at this time. He was suffering it there on the cross. Forsaken. So that you and I would never have to feel or experience or even know what that's like. So that as Jesus hung there His compassion, His mercy for a sinner like you and me who sins would be so evident that the amount of pain and suffering that He would go through, not just in the crucifixion, but emotionally, emotionally, mentally, excruciatingly, as the Father's wrath, the cup was drained at that very moment as much as God could muster up against the punishment of sin, because that's fair. And if you and I see this, and we see and feel nothing, then we missed it. Because if Jesus suffered this much for our sin, even if it's just one, but it isn't. How much more then would we in thanksgiving live our lives out of sheer and absolute thank you, Jesus, for going through what I never have to even be afraid to go through. That I never have to worry that God would ever forsake me because he did it here right now, to his own son, instead of me. Let's sing about that, shall we? John 19, verse 28, three short words. Jesus said, I am thirsty. Strange to hear, isn't it? I'm thirsty. 
why would these be words that Jesus would need to say? Isn't it kind of obvious? It's one of the excruciating effects of crucifixion is the absolute dehydration. The body would retain fluids and basically suck everything out of your body just to fill up the lungs and eventually suffocate on your own fluid. I know. Terrible, isn't it? And yet, why would Jesus stop to say these words, I'm thirsty? The scriptures actually answer that one. We read it earlier. They say, later knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would or might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. So it is to fulfill the scriptures. Which ones? Well, we sang it today, but we didn't sing those exact words. Psalm 22, verse 15, talks about Jesus, his tongue sticking to the roof of his mouth. Dry it out like a potsherd. You know how dry pottery is. And to show us, Jesus didn't stop being human, having an insatiable thirst. But yet also, he would take a drink here and not so much earlier because he needed to suffer the very pain and not have any of it dulled. No anesthesia, nothing. No nubane blocker, whatever they call it. No. He needed to drink first the cup of wrath and then have his thirst quenched so that he could speak later. And we'll bring that up later. Let's sing. John 19, verse 30, it is one word, tetelestai, meaning it is finished. If Jesus says these words, it could actually be misconstrued to to seem like Jesus is kind of in a moment of self-pride telling everybody, it's done, I finished it. Kind of like a little child does after they finish a project. Look at me, I'm so proud of myself. Maybe after we finish a project, look at what I've done. I've finished. I've accomplished it. I've run the marathon. Whatever it is. But that's not why Jesus says these words. We've learned by now this isn't really about Jesus taking more for himself. It's all about giving more glory as the Trinity in unity is again at work. Jesus is telling his father once again, it's finished. What you sent me to do here, I'm done. Nothing is left undone. Nothing more needs to be done. Nothing. And your sinful nature and mine wants to hear these words and say, but what about? No. It's stamped, paid in full. Have any of you ever taken one of your bills that you've spent a whole lifetime, let's say a mortgage or a large credit card bill, and you've spent a ton of time and energy paying that bill off, and it's done, and then you went back to the company and you said, I want to pay some more on this. Stupid, right? Who would do such a thing? Why do we do that? Why do we try to do that when Jesus has marked our payment For sin, done, finished, gone. And yet, in our sinful nature, we want to say, I want to help God out here. I want him to look at all of the good things that I've done and finished, or at least tried and accomplished. 
in my life? And Jesus cries out from the cross that one word, three in our language, it's finished. How could we offend our God who has finished and accomplished it by insisting that we could even help him, even a little bit? How can we offend him by somehow thinking he didn't take all of that sin away? How can we offend him by somehow thinking, well, that sin is so bad, there's no way he could forgive that one when he said, that one's finished too. Satan in your own sinful nature would love to hear that and loves to think that. But that's why Jesus cried out these words. It's finished. It's done. It's completed. It's fulfilled. What was foretold is accomplished, period. Nothing more to say. All, not by you and me, not by our pious attempts, not by our good will, not by our desires, not by our motivations, but by Jesus Christ alone. Let's sing about that. Luke 23, our last word, verse, 20, verse 46. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. This is the reason why he took that drink, so that in a loud voice for all to hear, you and me for ages to come, he goes back to his Father. Not my God, but Father. All the sin has been paid for, and now his Father is able to look at him and say, thank you. Just as we can look at him and say, thank you. And Jesus continues to glorify his father by saying, I trust you with my own soul. Who else is he going to cry out to? Who else is he going to find to be the caretaker of his soul? Would it be the universe? Would it be a better humanity? Would it be a new life lived in another dimension? As if there is some dimension apart from that which God would have his son to live in? It sounds ludicrous, but this is the world we live in. But it's not the world in which Jesus came to redeem and to die for. Which is why when he turns to, once again, his father, having paid for all the world's sins, his father hears, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And that's when he bows his head and dies. He gives himself over to death for you and me. And in so doing, finishes and accomplishes everything we could not. And then gives us some very encouraging words to say to when we near our death. May those be your words as that shallow breath becomes harder and more difficult to take. That we would say, just as Jesus did, trusting fully in his merits alone, Father, Into your hands, I commit my spirit. Amen. We respond.
Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? That the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. We pray. God the Father Almighty, who in the mystery of your eternal counsel did ordain your Son to be our sacrifice for sin, and upon whom you laid the iniquity of us all, give us your peace. Keep us mindful of our Savior's passion for us as he displayed it in this horrible cross and the great debt of love he paid for us there. In his suffering, show us that we too must enter the kingdom through much tribulation. In his wounds, give us enlightenment and encouragement in all of the adversities that we must face. By his crucifixion, teach us to crucify the desires of our own sinful nature. By his death and burial, remind us of our own baptism and the fact that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too have new life in him. As we have received your mercy and seen your glory in the face of Jesus and his cross, grant to us, Lord God, the comfort of your grace through him who died, but who rose again and evermore reigns as king in heaven and on earth. It's in his name we pray and join together as he has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you always. You're welcome to stay as long as you like. Please leave in silence. <laughs>